Hey, thanks so much for coming out. I'm Ann Hunt. I'm in the mayor's office. I'm the Environmental Sustainable po um, Policy Director for the City of St. Paul. So um, thank you very much for coming to our third meeting on climate change. But a little bit about why we're doing this. Um, the Mayor uh, Coleman signed an international agreement called the Compact of Mayors prior to the Paris Climate Talks in December of 2015. And this is um, an international agreement right now, over 600 cities worldwide are participating in it. And it had the cities um, pledge to do a number of activities. And that's what we're doing right now. So we had to, to make the commitment. Then we did a greenhouse gas inventory, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Anna Vang and our office worked really diligently with a lot of state agencies and others to do a comprehensive greenhouse gas inventory for the entire city. And then we need to do a vulnerability assessment, which we've been working on with Ramsey County, and we'll do, do a climate action and resiliency plan. The, frame, the compact outlined a three-year timeline. We're trying to compress this into two years, in part because we're, the city's embarking on, or in the process right now, of doing our comprehensive plan, which was required by the Metropolitan Council every 10 years. So we want to embed a lot of this information into that plan. Um, so the information right now, these are kind of our early information gathering. We'll be doing some other outreach activities this summer. We hope to have a draft plan starting the official planning commission process late August and um, early September. And then um, again, back up to the city council for another public hearing and public process and adopt it before the end of the year. So if you haven't signed up and given us your email, please do that because then it's helpful for us to make sure that you're notified of any updates that we have on the process. So just quickly, I wanted to share this for those that hadn't come before. This is from our greenhouse gas inventory. So um, I don't know if you can see it well enough, but the big um, gr blue is 37% is the transportation sector. So the on-road transportation, meaning cars and trucks, um, uh, accounts for 27%, and the other 10% is um, the airport and uh, barge and other kinds of things. I should have said, in this protocol that we needed to use, there's one of two databases and it's stipulated how we count things. So we have to count things that actually happen in the city of St. Paul. So all of the operations. So we do end up counting the entire wastewater treatment facility that's down at Pig's Eye Lake, even though it treats um, water, uh, wastewater from the surrounding metropolitan area. Um, we have, but it, since it's in St. Paul proper, we have to count all of those emissions. We have to count the emissions from Holman Field Airport, for example. So, and then the 37, 35% is our commercial and um, commercial buildings, and then 17% is the residential, and then everything else is kind of in there. Um, as I said, the wastewater treatment facility, I think, is um, oh. The industrial use is the 4%, and then there's wastewater treatment and solid waste. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. So for solid waste, most of uh, the waste in St. Paul goes to Newport to be processed. So the city of Newport would have to count all the waste that they process in Newport. But we're not really counting that because it doesn't happen technically in St. Paul. Did that make sense? Ah, uh, OK. All right, so that was just a little to ground people a little bit. So today we had our first meeting was all about buildings and a lot of information that we had with, we've been partnering with Xcel Energy and their partners in energy to really look at where the energy is used in buildings in St. Paul. Then we had one that was more on emergency management and public health. And this one, we're kind of going back to transportation, natural resources. Um, water and some other things. So the agenda, we've had a lot of partners from the National League of Cities. I can just want to make sure I shout out for that. Excel, I said, Ickley. So our, our agenda for today is just, we'll have, as I said, presentations for about an hour from three different um, people with different disciplines and are active in climate mitigation and, um, um, and adaptation activities in the state of Minnesota. And then we're going to have breakout tables. Some of you may want to leave after the presentations. That's fine. Otherwise, we'll gather at tables that have little post-it notes. We've got some facilitators from our city staff. I think Katie is here. Wes is here. Ellen, they're waving their hands. Lucy, um, who did I forget? Oh, Chris. Um, and then I just want a big round of applause um, for Anna Vang, who really organized the whole meeting. So Anna. 
And it, if you have detailed questions about the inventory, talk with Anna. And I know Jim Giebel's here who helped us plan too. So I just want to shout out to the city staff that are working here. Um, so tonight we have three presenters. Our first one is Paul Moss, who is with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And he's the climate adaptation coordinator for the state. He's been working on a number of activities in the state, including Green Step Cities, which helps cities do a number of sustainability activities. We also have Phil Schaffner, who is the policy planning director for the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Um, prior to his current position, he worked for the Office of Statewide Multimodal Planning. And then last, we'll have Leslie Brandt, who's a climate change specialist with the U.S. Forest Service. She works on climate change adaptation and outreach with forest resource managers in the Midwest and the Northeast part of the United States. So we're fortunate to have them here today. So our first speaker is going to be Paul Moss. Let's welcome Paul. Thanks very much. Great to be here. Glad to see so many folks have come out on a nice evening to uh, learn about climate change. So again, thanks, thanks for being here. Um, in the next 12 minutes or so, I'm going to go through these questions. I'm going to talk about what is climate change? What are some Minnesota climate trends that we're seeing? What's climate adaptation? And what can be done? So it's going to be pretty fast paced. Um, first, the greenhouse effect. I think most people are familiar with this, but just want to, it, it ties into understanding some of these climate impacts. So I just like to start talk sometimes with, with a few slides about the greenhouse effect. So essentially the greenhouse effect works when sunlight uh, passes through the transparent atmosphere, hits the earth's surface, and then is reflected back as infrared heat which is then absorbed by and reflected by greenhouse gases. And so it's the fact that when this reflected heat from the earth is kind of held in by the greenhouse gases, that's why the earth is uh, warming up from these greenhouse gases. And the, the greenhouse, the major greenhouse gases that are put out by humans are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Um, if you look at the correlation between the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the temperature globally, you can see that there's a very strong correlation here. Um, and actually there's, there's uh, from the uh, federal government which has put out the National Climate Assessment, you can see this chart which indicates 10 indicators of a warming world. And these are things that most of you know about already. Uh, on a global level we're seeing you know less less sea ice, less, glaciers are melting, sea level is rising, the uh, air temperature is rising, water temperature is rising, um, things like that. So there's not just one uh, metric of, you know, that the temperature is going up. There's actually a number of different ways that people are observing that, yes, the, the world is, uh, is warming. Um, in terms of how do we know that it's humans that are doing this and human impacts, um, if there's, there's various reasons why the Earth's climate changes over time naturally, and this has to do with the, uh, the strength of solar radiation, uh, it has to do with various uh, orbital patterns uh, of the Earth, uh, volcanic activity. Um, and so if you, if you just look at the natural factors that people understand are, are, are creating uh, our climate, actually we would expect in the last few decades to see the temperature going down. But instead, we're seeing the temperature going up, as you can see from that line there. And really, unless you put the greenhouse gases in the equation and, and, and include them to try and explain why the temperature is going up, it, it doesn't make sense otherwise. So this is another reason why scientists uh, feel that greenhouse gases are causing the Earth's climate to warm, because the natural forces would actually be right now having the Earth's climate getting cooler. Um, so the next three slides or so are, are from the Minnesota State Climatology Office from Kenny Blumenfeld. You'll see his contact information here. But essentially, uh, the State Climatology Office is, looks at a variety of different um, uh, research papers on climate change and, and their feeling from based on the research that they have reviewed is that they, they have the highest level of confidence that what we're already seeing has to do with climate change in terms of extreme cold. Uh, they're confident that the rapid decline in severity and frequency of extreme cold is due to uh, climate change, as well as extreme rainfall. We're seeing larger and more frequent heavy rainfall events. 
Um, they are also confident that the trends in heavy snowfall are connected with climate change where we're seeing more frequent large events. And uh, in terms of severe thunderstorms and tornadoes, there's not, in terms of what we're already seeing, there's not a lot of confidence that that's necessarily due to climate change. And in particular with heat waves and drought at the bottom of the chart, we're not really seeing changes from historical patterns. So there's no real recent increases or, or worsening to date for heat waves and drought. So the key impacts here, as I'll reinforce, have to do with less extreme cold and more extreme rainfall. And this again ties into the greenhouse effect in that the uh, warmer air can hold more water vapor and that's one reason why we're having greater precipitation. And also in terms of in the colder parts of the year and at night when it's staying warmer, that has to do with the fact that, that at night and in the colder times of the year that the Earth's heat is being held in by the greenhouse gases. So that's why it's not like we're seeing more heat hotter weather in the summer. We're seeing it more in winter at night, and so that's another kind of uh, indicator that, that what's causing that is, is the greenhouse gases holding in this reflected heat from the planet. Um, in terms of looking ahead beyond 2025, so looking ahead another decade or so, uh, here's how they're, they're feeling about the uh, confidence that certain uh, characteristics are due to climate change again less extreme cold, we're, ex we're expecting to see a continued rapid decline in extreme cold, and then unprecedented events are expected in terms of extreme rainfall. So, what, excuse me? Can you closer to the podium? Yeah, sure. So, um, so we're seeing uh, unprecedented events are expected within in about 10 years. And then if you notice in the previous chart for heat waves and drought, it was actually, uh, there was not really a trend, but Looking ahead another decade or so, they're expecting to see, they're highly confident that we're going to start seeing heat waves and also uh, moderately high that we'll start seeing drought. Uh, and then in terms of the trends about snowfall and uh, the thunderstorms and tornadoes, it's uh, less, less confident there. So just summarizing the main points, warming is well underway in Minnesota. Cold temperatures are warming the fastest, again, because of the way the greenhouse effect works annual precipitation increasing, extreme rainfall events increasing, and no trends at, to date for heat waves and drought. And here's the contact if you want to talk to anyone about that, Kenny Blumenfeld, the State Climatology Office. And these slides will be available afterwards. So what can we do? Climate mitigation and climate adaptation are two different approaches. Um, climate mitigation has to do with reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and that's very critical. Um, and climate adaptation has to do with dealing with the impacts of climate trends that we're already seeing. And that's what I spend my time on. So again, this just shows the two different areas, but it also shows that there's some overlap. So actually, when you're talking about climate adaptation and mitigation, there are some practices that can both help to deal with impacts of climate change as well as help to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll give you a few examples. First, just to mention that the state of Minnesota has been working on climate adaptation since 2009. Um, there's no mandate from the governor's office or the legislature to work on this, but the agencies have organized themselves into the interagency climate adaptation team, which I've been coordinating. Uh, it's essentially an agency-based approach, and there's about a dozen agencies that are listed here that are participating, including agriculture, commerce, health, DNR, MPCA, MnDOT, and others. Um, we've put out three different reports, one in 2017, um, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, the team meets quarterly and we've made various presentations. We've also set up some indicators to track uh, progress in climate adaptation and have made some recommendations. Uh, the current report was just issued a couple weeks ago. It's available online at the MPCA's website. It, it summarizes some of these climate trends and impacts and the agency activities that have been involved in trying to deal with them as well as making recommendations. And I have a four-page summary of that report on the back table there if anyone's interested. Or you can download the full 65-page report from the website. So what are some examples of actions that can increase uh, resilience or help to mitigate climate change as well as adapt to climate change? 
urban trees. You're going to hear more about this from Leslie Brandt, uh, one of the other speakers today. But anyway, urban trees have a lot that they can do both in terms of their shade can help with extreme heat as well as they can help to uh, reduce the impacts of, of uh, precipitation by, by breaking the rainfall as well as absorbing water from the roots. Water conservation, uh, there's a lot of energy that's involved in, uh, in transporting and, and heating and purifying water. So if you use less water, you're going to be more resilient for drought, but you're also going to be reducing energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. Similarly, things like green roofs, uh, permeable pavers, rain gardens, uh, other examples, sustainable agriculture, home insulation. These are all things that can help to make us more resilient to climate change impacts, as well as reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so adaptation, if you take one thing away from this, don't, I'd like you to walk away realizing that climate adaptation does not mean giving up. It means dealing with these actual real phenomena that we're seeing and also trying to do it in a way that in many, case, in many cases has some co-benefits uh, and can actually help our economy, environment, community health, and public safety. My last slide here is just to mention that there's three handouts that I brought. Uh, one is this uh, from, done by McAllister College and the City of St. Paul, this Ready and Resilient Guide to Extreme Weather in St. Paul. Uh, it's a very useful document for the general public. Uh, it talks a lot about actions that individuals can take in their communities and in their households. There's this summary, the four-page summary of that report. Um, and I want to mention in, my int in the introduction, Ann Hunt had mentioned that I was involved with Green Step Cities, but actually the MPCA staff that's most involved with Green Step Cities is sitting right there, Laura Milberg, who's a St. Paul resident. And if you're interested in that, uh, Laura has developed a wonderful uh, whole best practice in the Green Step Cities program on climate adaptation and resilience. And then the last thing here is just to uh, uh, note that there's some resources for email newsletters, websites, and other documents should you be interested in pursuing this uh, further. And feel free to give me a call at any time, too. So thanks so much for your attention and appreciate the opportunity to talk. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you. Again, my name is Philip Schaffner. I'm the Policy Planning Director for the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And I was born and raised in St. Paul and currently work at the central office at the Capitol in St. Paul. And um, I'm excited to be uh, part of this and excited that you're having this conversation. It's an important conversation that communities and transportation agencies uh, around the country are having, although not all of them necessarily use the term climate change. But every single Department of Transportation in this country is talking about this um, and dealing with it. And, and we are all struggling with how we are going to adapt and modify our infrastructure uh, as we go forward uh, in the coming decades. Um, when Ann asked me to come and talk, it was a little unclear whether I should be talking about mitigation or adaptation, and so I'm going to talk about both. Uh, most of my slides are on um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but I do want to take some time to talk about our infrastructure and the risks that our changing climate presents to the transportation system um, and some thoughts about things that we as a community need to, need to be working on. Um, this is going to look pretty similar to some of Paul's slides, but I've added in the transportation component here. So, um, and this chart is in our most uh, recent updated 20-year plan. It's called the Statewide Multimodal Transportation Plan. We just adopted the latest update in January. And as I'll mention the two main things that we are we have already changed in Minnesota and we are also forecasting increased continued change is increased heavy precipitation uh, and warmer winters and heavy precipitation for us is uh, very problematic in that uh, it washes out roads and bridges um, it can lead to landslides uh, that uh, can be multi-millions of dollars to repair and fix, and sometimes several years in the case of uh, the West River uh, Parkway over in Minneapolis um, near Riverside that just opened um, after several years. Um, and so uh, real, real risks to our roads, but it also presents risks to our rail network um, as well as to our airports and our ports. Um, and so uh, lots of heavy downpours are, are certainly an issue that, that we're wrestling with uh, and, and trying to get a, a handle on. Our state hydraulic engineers 
part of some national conversations right now to get better guidance on how to incorporate future climate projections into how we design bridges, culverts, drainage structures. Um, the Federal Highway Administration just released uh, a new circular with some guidance, some different ways of, of approaching it, but we think more is needed to better understand and better plan for how, uh, how our precipitation patterns are changing. On the flip side, in winter, um, warmer winters have some benefits. Um, there, sometimes it's nice to not be so cold, uh, but what we've seen is more ice and freezing rain. And that's a lot harder for our crews to deal with. Um, it's uh, a more precise uh, uh, practice in order to deal with in terms of clearing the, snow, uh, clearing the roads. And when it starts snowing, you can start plowing. Uh, but you have to time uh, ice a, a little bit more precisely and it can build up very fast and be very dangerous. Um, and so that's something we're, we're concerned about. It also affects the power grid, um, can have down power lines. Uh, again, a, a lot of our infrastructure is um, susceptible to significant ice events. Uh, we, one of the things that Paul didn't mention, but I, I think uh, I was gonna follow the next talk is uh, new species ranges. Well, how does that affect transportation? Well, we have, uh, we maintain a lot of roadsides uh, and we've seen new invasive species come in that our crews have to deal with from a maintenance standpoint. Uh, sometimes our, our vegetation can get overly stressed uh, and if it dies out, it loses some of its capacity to help uh, manage water or get erosion um, and have to repair. And so uh, this, is a, this is another effect that's maybe not one you might think of, uh, but one that we're dealing with as, an, as a transportation industry. Um, drought is one that um, can affect river navigability. Um, so we think about the economic viability of the port here in St. Paul. Uh, if the water gets too low, those barges can't get up uh, and there we, the, basically the river system shuts down. Uh, high heat can cause pavement buckling rail buckling, it can wreak havoc on some of the electrical systems and our transit systems. Um, and so certainly uh, a lot of considerations for us on the high heat side um, in terms of the operation of our transportation infrastructure. And then one last one that we don't really know uh, what climate change will do is wildfires. Um, not probably a, as much of an issue here in the city of St. Paul, but I'll note that wildfires um, can be a, a real issue for the transportation system and they can also change uh, the risk of flooding after uh, uh, a wildfire event. Um, and so it's something that we're trying to understand uh, as well. So a lot of moving pieces for us in the transportation industry. In 2013, we did a pilot project where we looked in northeastern and southeastern Minnesota and did an attempt to get a vulnerability of the state highway network to increased heavy precipitation and looked at um, different ways of measuring um, our risks of our current infrastructure. A lot of our infrastructure, as I'll note again later on, was designed 50 to 70 years ago uh, for a different climate than we have today and a different climate that we're gonna have. Um, and when we build infrastructure at, at MnDOT, we generally are building things, especially uh, bridges that last 80 to 100 years. And so there are real implications for us if the climate changes and we design uh, for an event that um, uh, is, is much smaller than what we actually receive. So I'll just note, uh, in terms of performance measures, uh, we have recently adopted a state target for transportation emissions for all forms of transportation um, with, our, with our plan. And this is consistent with the Next Generation Energy Act. We set a 2025 target of 29.5 million tons uh, from all forms of transportation. We thought we were also gonna have a federal measure um, looking at our national highway system uh, that had been noticed in the Federal Register at the end of the Obama administration. Uh, we just found out within the last week that that has been delayed indefinitely. Um, so uh, that was a measure we had advocated for with the Federal Highway Administration and pushed for. And we're happy to see, but our, um, uh, we'll no longer be at currently at least reporting nationally, but we have set a Minnesota target. Uh, we've got a ways to go. Um, emissions have come down from 2005 uh, in the transportation sector. Um, oh, we've, uh, my value is not showing up here. Um, but we have forecasted after several years of declines, uh, in 2015 we saw an uptick 
of emissions, and we are preliminarily also um, estimating that we will likely see another uptick in, in emissions from the transportation sector in 2016. Um, when, they, um, when they break down, the vast majority are from light and medium duty vehicles. These are essentially passenger vehicles, and I apologize about the chart here. A whole bunch of things are, are coming off. Uh, I'll just note that the vast majority are light and medium duty vehicles, um, but that uh, heavy duty, heavy commercial vehicles, large trucks, uh, as well as aviation make up about 25% of our emissions. And those are two sectors that are growing uh, faster than a lot of our other sectors. And so when we think about emissions, it's not just the vehicles that we drive uh, as individuals. It's also how goods move through our communities. Uh, and it's also how we do longer distance travel uh, in, through aviation. Uh, rail and ports uh, are down in much smaller things, natural gas transmission, um, there's a couple of other forms of emissions, but, but, but that's the, the general picture of Minnesota emissions. One of the reasons for the uptick in 2015 was after about a decade of no change in the overall miles traveled in Minnesota, uh, we saw uh, an increase again. And we're also preliminarily, uh, we'll have an increase again in 2016. We're still finalizing that number. Uh, so after a decade of essentially no growth, we are now seeing growth again um, in the vehicle miles traveled in the state of Minnesota. Uh, we have seen growth in transit, which is a good trend from the emissions standpoint, um, but uh, not necessarily growing as fast as we might uh, hope for and desire if we're going to bend the curve uh, on transportation emissions. And I'll just say that transportation emissions are slow to change. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that, uh, and, it's a, and it's a challenging uh, sector to work on given that we are all involved in this, right? It's, it's not a single power plant or a few power plants. It's millions of vehicles, millions of individual decisions. Um, and a lot of them are determined based on our, our land uses and where our development patterns are. And when we think about the vast majority of buildings in 2030, most of them already exist. Um, you know, I grew up uh, on Portland Avenue in Dunlap, St. Paul. Uh, when I look at the neighborhood, I grew up in St. Paul. Um, there's a few new buildings on Grand. The Red Owl is now a Kowalski's. Uh, but more or less, my neighborhood looks very similar now as it did when I grew up. Now, there are some notable exceptions here in the city of St. Paul, and they have had some development. And with the Ford site, some pretty significant opportunities for new development. But when you look at the citywide scale, a lot of the, a lot of the buildings that we're going to have 15 to 20 years from now are already the buildings that exist today. Um, and that sets a pattern for transportation. Also, the majority of our roads, bridges, rail lines, transit lines in 2030 also already exist. So a lot of the future transportation infrastructure uh, is already in place. Not to say that we can't make changes, but a lot of them are going to be smaller changes um, that the overall footprint is already in place. And we hold on to our cars uh, for quite a while. The average vehicle in Minnesota is more than 11 years old. Um, so when we think out, there are cars that will be driving in 2030 that are already driving on our roads today. Um, so it takes a long time to see large scale changes in the transportation sector. As a backdrop for that, uh, we, have a pr we have an aging infrastructure. Um, we are reaching the place where we now need to start um, replacing a lot of our infrastructure. Most of it was built 40 to 60 years ago. Most of it is now at the place where we need to do substantial repair to it. Um, and this is a huge focus for MnDOT and uh, maintaining this, this aging infrastructure and this investment. So when we think about transportation emissions, uh, for the most part, there are a few exceptions and things like refrigerants um, and some of the wheels, but almost all of the emissions can get boiled down to this simplified equation. The distance traveled multiplied by the amount of energy it takes to go that distance multiplied by the amount of emissions, uh, emissions um, from that energy. And so you can imagine a lot of different strategies to work on how far we travel, how much energy, the efficiency of, of that travel, as well as um, the uh, emissions in that energy. So a lot of different ways to approach this. There's way more strategies than I have time to talk about. Um, I'll talk about a couple here, though, briefly. Um, one is sort of the complementary strategies of compact and mixed-use development that helps create the opportunities for shorter trips. 
On the, on the building side, which I think you talked about last time, there are some efficiencies to gain there. Uh, but it also creates the necessary density to support transit um, and to support higher frequency and higher quality transit. Likewise, investing in transit and biking and walking uh, create and support those development patterns and create opportunities for uh, developers to come in and build uh, more compact and mixed-use development. So strategies that work together. But ultimately, if we're going to think longer term, when we think about the Next Generation Energy Act, and a lot of cities have adopted this 80% reduction target, to get to the 80% reduction target, in many ways, we have to think about the emissions per unit of energy. And that's where strategies and technology like electric vehicles come in. They're not the sole solution to this, but they're an important piece of it. Uh, in particular, for light and medium duty vehicles, um, buses is a new, new area um, where Duluth Transit is doing a, uh, some electric buses. Now Metro Transit's actively exploring what routes could deploy electric buses. Um, it's probably not going to be a viable strategy in the short to medium term for heavy duty vehicles, uh, but increasingly this is an option that, and a strategy we're trying to look to in the state of Minnesota. It's important to think about where the energy comes from for these vehicles, but as our grid gets more uh, efficient and less uh, fossil fuel dependent, the more viable these vehicles become to help reduce transportation emissions. Um, you won't be able to see this because it's too small, but um, this is from our uh, new annual sustainability report that the agency, MnDOT, now produces. This is our 2016 report. It's our very first one, um, it's sort of a baseline, but in addition to setting a target for transportation emissions from the entire sector in Minnesota, we've set internal preliminary agency targets as well for our buildings, for our fleet, uh, as well as um, for our highway construction activities. Uh, and so at MnDOT, we're increasingly looking at what can we do as an agency to reduce our own uh, emissions from our own activities. A couple of other things that we've done, we've recently formed uh, a sustainable transportation steering committee made up of key managers and leaders throughout the agency, which is uh, championed by our deputy commissioner, chief engineer, Sue Mulvihill. Uh, and we've been looking at, we worked with uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, and Indiana to designate uh, I-94 uh, from Michigan all the way to Moorhead as an electric vehicle charging corridor. Um, and we'll be adding some signage in the near future to help point out where there are uh, vehicle charging stations along the corridor. We've been working with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency on a broader plan for electric vehicle charging in the state. We've been, um, uh, have had a complete streets policy now for several years and have been on a path towards developing and, and pushing for more complete streets. I'll also say that um, MnDOT in partnership with the cities and county engineers in, in the state of Minnesota is in the process of updating our state aid design guidelines that allow for things like narrower lanes um, and uh, without needing to get exemptions. And so there is new flexibility that's available for cities and counties and how we design our roads. Um, we're also exploring ways to deploy solar on our facilities or in our right-of-way. And um, we're engaging many of our transportation agency partners in a discussion about how can we collectively as an agency uh, reduce emissions. MnDOT um, uh, is only responsible for 10% of the roads in the state. So we have uh, a lot of our work in this field is to work in partnership. I'll just lastly say for us, the wild card though is, uh, is what's happening in vehicle technology. Um, as uh, autonomous vehicles, autonomous trucks, autonomous uh, ground, deli ground delivery vehicles start being deployed, we're concerned about what imp implication this has, and it's really an unknown for us, something that we're tracking, but will be coming to a city street near you within the next five to 10 years. Um, there's more information at mindot.gov slash climate, um, and uh, I thank you for your time and attention. So um, again, I'm Leslie Brandt. I am with the U.S. Forest Service and also a group called the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. And we work to integrate climate change considerations into natural resource management across the Midwest and Northeast. So tonight I'm going to be talking specifically about some of the work we're doing related to adapting urban forests to climate change since we're here in an urban area in St. Paul. I am myself a St. Paul resident. I live in Highland. Um, and so to start out, I'd like to just give you guys a definition of what I mean when I say urban forests. So 
How I define urban forests as all publicly and privately owned trees within an urban area, and this includes individual trees along streets and in backyards, as well as stands of remnant forests. So anywhere there's trees, that's part of that urban forest. So why do urban forests matter when we're thinking about mitigating and adapting to climate change? One of the main things that urban forests can provide is they help offset some of our fossil fuel emissions. So they um, provide shade in the summer and they reduce our, our cooling energy use because of that. And they help provide wind breaks in the winter and help reduce our heating energy use. And it's estimated across the city of St. Paul that that economic value is about $2.8 million per year. Another benefit that urban forests provide is in helping to reduce our stormwater runoff. Paul mentioned this earlier. Um, and this benefit is also uh, estimated about $3.4 million per year for the urban forests in St. Paul. Another more intangible benefit that people don't often think about is the social component of urban forests and these can this can help with community resilience and there's been a lot of work done by my colleagues at the US Forest Service that has shown that urban forests can help with healing after large-scale disturbance events and so trees and nature um, help people come together and create community cohesion a lot of cities are starting to recognize this, about um, a third of all climate action plans for cities include um, urban forestry as part of their climate change strategy. States, uh, about two thirds include climate change, um, or include urban forestry as part of their climate change strategies. And then um, the vast majority of cities do view trees as part of their overall um, climate and sustainability goals. A little bit about St. Paul's urban forest, just to orient you. Um, the overall compensatory value of our urban forest is estimated about $10 million per year. And this includes energy reduction, stormwater mitigation, um, aesthetic values, and air quality. Currently, we're at about 32% canopy cover for St. Paul, which is actually pretty good in comparison to a lot of other Midwestern large cities. Um, but there is a lot of potential for an increase in canopy cover. Um, we could get up to about 66% um, if we um, increase our canopy cover to cover all potential areas. And the areas where we have the greatest potential is on those in residential lands. So in your backyards, um, that's where there's the greatest potential for increases in canopy cover. A little bit about the species composition. So um, we're not really where I think would be ideal for biodiversity. Um, as you know, emerald ash borer is sweeping through the Twin Cities, and um, we have about one in five of our trees as ash trees, and all of those are vulnerable to attack from emerald ash borer. There's a similar amount of um, maple trees in our canopy, and maple trees um, are vulnerable to another pest that's not here now but could come in called the Asian longhorn beetle. So if you put those two things together, that is a huge potential for an economic um, loss to our city. So that's just talking more about other effects on our urban forests, but let's talk a little bit about what that means in the context of climate change. Now, one of the most obvious effects of climate change is the direct effect of changes in temperature on habitat suitability for our trees. This set of maps shows hardiness zones um, for the state of Minnesota um, from 2010 to 2039, 2040 to 2069, and 2070 to 2099. And this is under a low and a high emission scenario. 
Here in the Twin Cities, we're about a zone four. There's some areas that might be borderline for zone five. This is how we determine what can be planted where. So any gardeners in this room would be familiar with hardiness zones. And by the end of the century, under that high emission scenario, we could be up to a zone seven. And even under that low emission scenario, we could go up to a, um, a zone five or six. So that means that a lot of the things that we have currently planted now are not going to be able um, to survive under those hotter conditions and that there is a new opportunity for new species to be potentially planted. There's also a number of other stressors besides just the direct effects of temperature that can affect our trees and ecosystems. So. Um, Drought right now has not really been an effect in the observational record, but some of the climate models suggest that we might get drier summers or falls later in this century. And even if we don't get a reduction in precipitation, an increase in temperature will increase evapotranspiration, um, evaporation from soils, transpiration from trees that will reduce the amount of so soil moisture in our, uh, in our soils. We mentioned the increase in heavy precipitation events. That is definitely affecting flooding. Um, that can have direct effects on our ecosystems as well. Um, more extreme storm events. That's a no-brainer. We've all seen it where a heavy thunderstorm comes through. We have branches down. If we have more ice storms and, and less um, snowstorms, we could see more um, branch damage from that as well. And then um, a lot of people don't necessarily think about this, but when we have milder winters and we have wetter conditions in the spring, we could open up conditions for new pests and diseases, or current pests and diseases could become even more problematic. So which trees do we think are going to be more vulnerable in this area? We can use models to look at that. Um, some of the things that we're seeing from the model projections are that a lot of our more northern um, iconic tree species are expected to decline across the state. So these are things like paper birch, balsam fir, white spruce, white pine, black spruce. A lot of the things that we really associate with our identity as a state. Um, here in the Twin Cities and in parts of southern Minnesota, we also expect to see a decline in habitat suitability for some of our more temperate tree species, such as sugar maple, American linden, or also called basswood, and choke cherry. Now there are trees that can benefit from those milder conditions and warmer weather. Um, here are some examples of things that might actually benefit from changes in climate. So eastern redbud, um, this is a species that I, is planted around here but is native to south of here like Iowa and Missouri. I have one planted in my front yard now and it's, it's beautiful. Um, wild plum and Ohio buckeye are two other examples of things that the models suggest might be um, able to survive well over the next several decades. So how do we adapt our urban forests and urban ecosystems to climate change? Our group tends to think about adaptation as along a spectrum from trying to resist change to trying to facilitate transitions um, to align with future conditions. And in the middle is this idea of resilience. And you hear this term a lot, resilience. What does that mean? Well, in an ecological context, we think of resilience as an ability of an ecosystem to withstand a disturbance and bounce back. So it, you can think of it as like a rubber band. So some examples, if you're more on that resistance end, where you're trying to keep things the way they are, you might water during periods of drought. You might apply insecticides to prevent um, pest damage. You might um, protect um, trees that you care about that are adapted to more northern climates in little microclimate areas that are on north-facing slopes or on the north side of your home where they don't get exposed to as much sunlight. 
On the resilience side, the main thing that we can do is increase our biodiversity. Um, if you are thinking about planting something in your backyard, consider a tree that's not so common in your area. Look around you, think about some alternatives. Um, you can also think about planting native species and other species that are able to withstand a wide variety of stressors. So this might include um, being able to withstand drought and flooding and a variety of pests and diseases. Um, pruning your trees to be able to withstand those storm events. So making sure there's a strong branch structure there. And then finally, planting trees at a proper depth. Now this might sound like so simple, but it is a, a huge cause of why trees fail in urban areas. Finally, on this idea of facilitating transitions, um, there are also a number of things you can do. Um, a big thing that a lot of people hear about are rain gardens as we have more heavy rain events. Having those um, rain gardens available to absorb that additional moisture is really important. Incorporating rain barrels for storage of water for later use for watering is another thing that you could do. Um, considering planting more southern species, I know that sounds a little <laughs> dangerous to some people, but um, here in urban areas, we always have planted a lot of non-native species. So it's not, it's not something that's foreign to a lot of urban foresters. And then finally, thinking about planting um, prairie plants in sunny areas. Now, we've been working with a lot of um, natural resource managers over the last couple of years on um, working through a very formal process of integrating climate change considerations into their decision-making processes. We had an event last fall where we um, invited people and that included um, some people in the Natural Resources Department in St. Paul. Um, one an example of a project that somebody um, put together as part of this workshop process was in Hennepin County. So two of the cool things that they're doing, and I, I think a lot of the folks in St. Paul are also thinking about this. One is a gravel bed nursery and the the thing with the gravel bed nursery is it helps um, produce a lot of trees at a low cost and ensures that they have a really strong root structure and they're um, pr planted at a proper depth. They're also incorporating more southern tree species, including um, some more southern hickory species that are found in the southern part of the state or into Iowa. If you have any other questions, um, feel free to contact me. My email address is below, or you can look at our website. Thank you. So is there um, a couple of specific questions that people might have? I think if you want to stand, raise your hand and stand up, and then maybe I'll try to repeat it. OK, go ahead. Uh, I guess this is a question for uh, Phil. I was wondering areas like uh, where they encounter monsoon seasons in other countries. Have experiences with our their transportation systems and dealing with heavy rainfall. So the question was areas that experience monsoons, other countries, if they have experienced. Um, a I guess is the question: Are we talking with them about how to manage uh, our air transportation? Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, MINDAT does have an aeronautics department. I personally um, only have a tangential role with them, um, but I, it's certainly a question we can pose to the Metropolitan Airports Commission that runs MSP. Um, uh, they handle all kinds of things at MSP, and so my guess is that they are having those kinds of conversations, um, but, um, but I don't know if they're talking with you know, countries that have monsoons. Has MINDOT looked at geofiltering for heating growth So, if I think I understand the questions, have we looked at essentially 
using geo energy or geo heat to uh, reduce the amount of um, uh, that we would need to um, melt snow or, or plow snow. Uh, it's not something we've actively deployed. It's it, it's possible. It's something we've researched. I just don't personally know. Um, uh, we have embedded um, a lot of sensors in our roads and, and have used sort of pucks to shoot out. Um, a lot of our newer bridges will often deploy on the on the bridge, but uh, is not something that I, I personally know whether we've researched that or not. Sure, Mary. Hey, Phil. Sorry to keep hammering away at you. Uh, I'm wondering if So the the goal of reducing speed limits such that we have uh, lower speeds in winter um, is not an active consideration in and in of itself in terms of winter climate. Um, although we do recommend that you slow down in winter, um, the uh, setting and how we set speed limits is a is, is a complicated discussion. Um, a lot of it is set also by statute um, and. One of the things that a lot of it comes down to the original road design um, and although speed limits are an important indicator for, for drivers, a lot of people drive closer to the safe driving speed that the road was designed for. We often refer to it as the design speed um, and not what the posted speed limit is. Um, and so we can adjust the posted speed but that doesn't necessarily adjust behavior in the same way as changing the design of the facility to add elements that would naturally psychologically um, have you drive slower. Um, and so um, it's a it's a balancing act for us about how we set speed limits. Um, uh. Any natural resources questions? <laughs> Go ahead, Teresa. Um, uh, question about uh, even though we don't anticipate forest fires probably impacting the city of St. Paul, um, I've and maybe some of us remember from a few years ago when the forest fires up in Canada had kind of, you know, through the airflow brought it down here into the cities for a number of days. So I guess I'm just thinking about climate impacts in other places impacting our air quality. Yeah, I think, is this on? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, yes, so um, fire is a, is a major concern in our wildland areas, especially out west. Um, as many of you know, we have um, the mountain pine beetle um, attacking a lot of the um, trees out in the Rockies, and then we have all this fuel buildup of um, trees, and when you get a lot of hot, dry summers, you ha create the perfect conditions for fire. And so that is definitely a concern and definitely something that we should anticipate more of in the future. We had a question in the back, the gentleman over there in the corner. Yeah, so in terms of increasing tree canopy, I assume there might be some trade off in terms of suitability for solar for houses. If you're talking about water being the primary place where we have the potential to increase tree canopy. I don't know if there's some trade off as far as hiking trees that we're going to look at and find the tools for helping to understand. Yeah, that's a great question. I am I am not a, a solar energy expert, um, but yes, a lot. I think a lot of the benefit potential for the shade benefits of trees um, would be in the same area as if you were trying to do um, a, a solar roof, and so you would have to think about those trade-offs. Um, I, I I I don't know. Um, that that's certainly something to consider. Um, I don't know if either of you. Yeah. Well. Um, so the the main benefits you're going to get as um, the 
ecosystem services you're going to get are from larger canopy trees. Um, they are going to provide more shade, they are going to absorb more carbon, they are going to absorb more stormwater. Um, it's certainly better to have more vegetation than less, and so if, I mean, you could think about planting some of those shorter stature trees and shrubs in some of those areas, but where we're gonna get, you're gonna get a lot of that benefit is from those larger canopy trees. Um, maybe one more question, John? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to follow up with Bill, you mentioned the state aid standards. Can you clarify the status of those? Are there draft standards we can review or yeah, there are, it's in the process um, of rulemaking right now. Um, and so there was a report that you can review um, that's uh, part of Minnesota's or MnDOT's legislative reports. Um, and, and certainly I think I could potentially follow up that was a set of recommendations that uh, a group of city and county engineers in MnDOT uh, put together that also had an advisory panel of uh, uh, bicycle transit and pedestrian advocates, um, including St. Paul Smart Trips Transit for Livable Communities that um, helped to advise them. Um, but it's a, there's a formal rulemaking process that I, that I believe they are in right now um, uh, that they have to go through to then be official. Um. All right, let's give a round of applause for our speakers.